Pleasure to be here in sunny California from snowy and icy Minnesota. Um, my colleague and I, Shalini Gupta, we got off the plane and we were just like hopping along the sidewalk here. Um, but we, click, we quickly acclimated because last night when we were coming home after dinner, she actually needed a jacket by the time we got to the hotel. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I'm going to take a minute, I'm going I'm, I'm gonna to build it back out for a second, because I think um, in some of the work that we do, um, we try and figure out how we can continue to um, focus, support, enhance um, what we believe is the true democratic way in which we solve these problems, which is at the community level, but in a society that has institutions, economic, political, institutions that are all uh, consumed by this notion of large scale, right? And I think you, you pointed to that, Nikki, in terms of the constant question is, you know, how, well, those are great little examples, but how are you gonna scale them up, right? We're constantly asked that question. So I wanna put, put just some context in ter terms of the gravitas of the problem that we have. According to the latest IPCC report, um, the, the carbon storage of the atmosphere, in order for us to keep at a sustainable level, is at about 2,900 gigatons, right? We have used 1,900 of those gigatons since 2011. We have used two-thirds of the carbon storage of the atmosphere since um, as of 2011, which means we only have one-third left before we actually do major um, planetary damage. Um, when our center, and, and borrowing from a previous center that I worked at this, um, in, at the University of Delaware, did some just very rudimentary calculations and said, okay, if we took the world's population and um, we, 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 we projected out to the year 2050, which is where we're all kind of benchmarking, and given the amount of carbon storage that we have left in the atmosphere, what would that um, mean in terms of our each, each individual capacity to emit um, carbon? That is, if we really believe that the Earth is a commons, if we really believe that the atmosphere is a commons, then no one person in this world should have greater access to that carbon storage than any other person on the planet, regardless of where they live, regardless if they live in the United States or whether they live in Guatemala. Whether they live in Ghana or whether they live in Denmark, we all should have equal access, right? That's what it would mean. And so when we did the calculations, the per capita emission rate is at about 3.3 to 3.6 tons per person, is what we each should emit in order to keep us at that sustainability level. 3.3 to 3.6 per person. The United States hovers between 17 and 21 tons per person. 17 to 21 tons per person. When we're talking here in California, in our local communities about clean energy, there is no greater connection to what we're doing as being citizens of the planet than that figure. Because it means by living our everyday lives, we are actually creating a debt our society has taken from the rest of the world's capacity for development by virtue of the way we live our lives. Now, when we're talking about energy democracy, and we're saying that democracy is really about fundamentally, fundamentally self-determination, the right to determine how we live our lives, the morals and the ethics that we bring to the table, how we structure our institutions, of which the energy system is a major institution, then energy democracy, true democracy, should be about us being able to define that architecture in a way that says, you know, as human beings, as a community in LA, as a community in Minneapolis, as a community in New York, we demand that our contribution to the carbon storage should be no more than 3.3 tons per person, and we demand that our infrastructure be set up that way so that we do not take from other members of the world. At this point, we don't have that capacity, right? 
Why? Because we have very highly centralized energy institutions that have been in the making over, for over 200 years, that have been in the making on the basis of an understanding of energy as a commodity to be extracted from the earth, to be produced, and then to be sold back to us as community members for profit maximization. That is a relatively new phenomenon in human history. That's only about 200 years old, 250 years old, that we have reduced the earth to a set of capital inputs to feed in to an energy system so that we can purchase it to get the lights, the heat, cooling, cooking, etc. Prior to that time, we were much more connected to the energy and we understood it to be we only used energy as we needed it, and we, only, and we did not perceive of the earth as a commodity. As an indigenous person, the idea of private property did not exist, again, not very long ago in this human history. But yet we've created this energy system that now says in order to get our basic services, and energy is a basic service, I contend that it's a human right, in order to get that energy services to live our life, we have to utilize energy as a commodity. What we need to do, I think, if we're going to really transform, really transform into an energy democracy with a big D, not energy democracy with a small d, right? Energy democracy with a small d is the first phase to getting us to energy democracy with to the big D. Energy democracy with a small d is being able to reorient our energy institutions to do the kinds of things that you all are doing in terms of community choice aggregation, cooperatives, sort of moving and shifting our energy systems away from a corporatist commodity-based right, infrastructure. But energy with a big D is actually transforming, retransforming again the way we understand energy. That it is part of Mother Earth, that it is a significant, uh, not a resource for capital input. And that what we really are asking for when we're using energy is we're asking for ways to keep our families warm, to keep our families uh, healthy when uh, there's high heat, having the ability to cook, having the ability to move our families and ourselves from place to place, to have access to basic goods and services. That's what we're doing. And that requires us moving from an energy as commodity to an understanding of energy as commons or services. And that's going to require us then to every time we look at these um, particular models that are being developed is to constantly reflect then how does this particular practice and model get us that first step to moving to energy with a big D, transforming our energy regime so that it's no longer corporatist, that it's based on the commons, and that it's based on us as citizens of the world not simply because we have the right, you know, because we have the infrastructure that we should be able to use it. I think the other dimension, and I'll close really quickly. One of um, um, one of my um, one of the interesting authors that um, I've been reading lately is Chimanda Ngozi Adichie, and she has a wonderful way in which she talks about the problem of the single story. Right? She talks about the problem of the single story is not that it's a single, that in of itself that it's wrong. The problem of the single story is that it's incomplete and that it, it doesn't allow us for a true fuller understanding of the world around us. So, for example, in climate change, as um, Nikki was talking about and others were talking about, the single story, and Al, the single story is about carb greenhouse gas reductions. The single story is that we have to act urgently. The single story is that we have this massive infrastructure, energy infrastructure that emits energy. And so we conflict with our brother and sister environmental organizations who find that is the sole purpose of our actions, that that's the urgency. But if we expand the story to begin at a different time in history, then climate change doesn't begin with the existing energy system to reduce greenhouse gases. It begins with the appropriation of native lands that were cleared 
the virgin forests were cleared, which now we're trying to figure out how to plant more trees so that they can be carbon sequestered. Cleared the lands, replaced a natural way, a sustainable way of life with one that was based on extractive industry. If we start from a different point in history, then the infrastructure of building this massive transportation system that also obliterated many of our communities of color and at the same time created a highly greenhouse gas intensive transportation system, we have a different point of entry. If we start with redlining and housing discrimination and segregation whereby we actually disinvested from whole communities of color and made that housing in those communities much less efficient as a result of that and now are emitting much more, using more energy and, and, and emitting much more greenhouse gas um, emissions, that's a different point of entry. And so I think for us what we suggest is that like the rest of you that are here, and we really appreciate being here, is that those are that those are the multiple stories that we have to bring to bear, and if we're really going to fashion a truly democratic energy democracy, so it's really exciting to be here with all of you, and start um, engaging the conversation with you, and figure out ways that we can do that. Thank you very much.